Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for this wonderful privilege to gather together as family in the unity of the faith, Father. Thank you so much for Scripture that continues to set us free, for that is the reason why Jesus went to the cross. It was for freedom that he set us free, for the sake of it, for the purpose of it, so that we might live eternal life in the future, but also have that great hope in time based on that the merits of our Lord. We're so very grateful for this church, for the ability to gather together without being persecuted the way some are uh, in this world, even to death. Thank you, Father, for keeping the wolves at bay. But also thank you for affording us the opportunity to take advantage of such things and take the gospel out to a world that needs it so desperately, Father. Thank you for your grace and love, and we pray for those that can't be here but earnestly desire to be here with us this evening, and also, of course, we pray for those that are still lost. We're most grateful and thankful, of course, for your Son's work, our Lord and Savior on the cross, to cancel out that debt and make every day a reality for us to live in the gospel, to appreciate all that he accomplished on our behalf. We do just ask for your blessings on this evening's message. May it be edifying for our souls. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Again, why are the apostles so encouraging? By grace, they were prepared. Uh, The whole idea, of course, with this series is that we are able to relate to real people. The apostles are not 50-foot statues in front of basilicas. They're They're not supposed to be idolized. We're supposed to relate to them. The Bible captures um, moments in their lives, obviously not all of them, but key moments in many ways that we're able to, even you know, a couple of thousand years later, to relate to these individuals. And that's what the Spirit wants us to do. Consider them people, relate to them as people, not fictional characters, not idols, uh, you know, nothing, quote, special other than what grace had done in each of them. Um, Just a quick review, though, of Tuesday's lesson uh, with some additional perspective. An awful lot on um, that fantastic passage in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 that begins with rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. I was thinking of this way when I was listening to Tuesday evening's message. Like every other blessing designed by God, joy has been counterfeited. When a blessing is counterfeited, the true substance of it will never be received. It's a lie. Do this and you'll rejoice. Do that and you'll rejoice. Do this and you'll have joy. But when it's counterfeit, you never receive that joy. It's always fleeting. You're always chasing some carrot. So like every other blessing designed by God, joy has been counterfeited when a blessing is counterfeited, the true substance of it will never be received by grace through faith because God gives grace to the humble. This leaves a person searching forever. Now, some of you are already going, I, you know, that was, that's me or that was me to a much larger degree. Thank God I'm not there. Or it's so-and-so in my life. Uh, most of us know people. I certainly know a lot of people who are searching in this world. And unfortunately, they have a, let's call it a litany of um, failed experiments behind them. You know, chewed carrots, sort of tossed to the side, uh, that grew bitter over time, thought they had something real, chased it for a while, uh, made them, quote unquote, counterfeit happy or counterfeit uh, joyful for a moment. Um, But then it soured. And, you know, most of us can relate to this personally uh, as well as know people personally that are still chasing things, searching, I like to call it. Some buy new stuff. Some have shopping addictions. They buy new cars. They buy new homes, etc. Others have different addictions, searching for their new, let's call it a high. What's my high this week? What's my high this month? What's my high today or this year even? And still, of course... My favorite, others are searching for the so-called perfect mate, 
when Jesus has already made himself completely available to them. Meanwhile, there is a constant supply of counterfeits being presented before them by Satan and the kingdom of darkness. And unfortunately, many people fall into temptation, both unbelievers regarding their salvation and even believers regarding their peace. It's disturbing, um, truly disturbing, how many counterfeits exist for both unbelievers and believers in this world. And the one, I guess, you know, being a pastor and my commission being to tend the sheep and the sheep being believers, it's very disturbing for me to see any of you and other believers, frankly, without peace, without some contentment, without some real joy, um, that they're chewing on some carrot, they're chasing something, they're searching, uh, you know, looking for love in all the wrong places. Remember that one? You're not going to make me sing it, are you? That's what they're doing. They're really looking for love. They're looking to be loved. And they're, they're chasing a counterfeit. They're searching. And where does that usually start? Let's face it. Opposite sex. Sound familiar? And since there's so many bums out there, men and women, people go after the wrong people who are actually agents for Satan. And so it just breaks my heart to see these people chasing yet another you know, dead end. So what the Spirit's been emphasizing uh, lately uh, are some key things with this congregation up here on the board. You wouldn't be searching, I guess is what he's saying. You wouldn't be searching so much if you learned to pay attention to the little things. For example, I shared that with you before we opened up, that we almost didn't have church tonight because we lost power. And if it wasn't for a faithful deacon who got us back up and going, uh, and David came in and, and got us up and running with the AV uh, room, we wouldn't have church, or we wouldn't at least maybe not even be able to record it for others or live stream it. Everybody forgets about all those little things, all those little blessings. You know, look who's not here tonight. Well, the only, re the only way they're going to get it is either live or on demand later, or maybe on their little iPod. I don't know. But where there's a lot of little things that go on just in a ministry like this. But what about your life? You're all ministers, after all. How is he blessing you out so that you can minister the gospel to others? How has he sustained you? What about the bread of life? Are you taking it? Are you emaciated? Are you reading the Bible on your own time? Or are you starving for it? These are the little things, the, the grace things. So before it's too late, let us appreciate all the so-called little things in life. May we suppose even that the, quote, little things are actually the big ones. Can we? Think about that. All the little things. Are they actually the big things? In other words, just the genuine faithfulness of the Lord in every little aspect of our lives. Is that not a really big thing? But we become familiar to appreciate the little things is to appreciate grace, as we've been learning. But you see, the lie from the father of lies, the great counterfeiter, is that the little things are indeed little. That's the lie. And the so-called big things, money, reputation, relationships, etc., are the big things. And that's the lie. But we know what God has to say about such things that the world esteems. Go to 1 Corinthians 1, 27. 1 Corinthians 1, 27. <clears throat> I still keep going back, and I think about these things a lot. I know you do as well. <clears throat> you hear an awful lot about... People use the word blessing a lot. Oh, I'm so blessed. And sometimes I hear it even from people that aren't even Christians. And I say, what does that even mean? What do you mean you're blessed? And I hear Christians say, I'm so blessed. And um, nobody really wants to call the truth to the table. What do you mean by blessed? Do you mean you got something that you wanted? Are you sure it's a blessing? Are you sure it's from God? That's what you should be asking. 1 Corinthians... Because remember, it's not this, it's what you think of this. Even if you get it, 
And it may be, you might find out that it's a counterfeit or you got it outside of God's timing. 1 Corinthians 1.27, But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised, God has chosen the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. So that, just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Again, that's what God has to say about the things the world esteems. So up here on the board again, the little things. Before it's too late, let us appreciate all the so-called little things in life, and may we suppose even that the little things are actually the big ones. Up here on the board. To appreciate the little things is to appreciate grace. That's what he's been saying. He's like, there's such an abundance of grace. I mean, I'm breathing right now. There's a little tickle in my throat, probably not perfect respiratory health. I don't know, but I'm breathing. I'm here. I'm able to speak. I'm able to do this fantastic thing that without the grace of God, I have no right doing. Nor do you. You're hearing my voice, right? You're seeing me. Those are all grace blessings. You're sitting down in a comfortable chair. You're not being bombed. You're not being shot at. You're not being persecuted. Do we forget all these things? These are not given. We're so entitled, especially Americans. So to appreciate the little things is to appreciate grace. And we're going to go to John 1 in a second. That's the, that's the truth about grace. And speaking of grace and truth, go to John 1.1. 1, 1. John 1.1. 1, 1. We're, going to, we're going to look at a lot of Scripture this evening. <clears throat> so hopefully you're nice and limber, warmed up. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John, he came as a witness to testify about the light, that's John the Baptist, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which, coming into the world, enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him, but... As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received, and this came out on Tuesday, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. I wanted to give you a little bit more on grace upon grace. Refers to the fact that God showers his children with grace, which is really love. Christ, his Son, has made this possible. In light of this, Christ rightly becomes our central source of gratitude and focus. Consider Ephesians 1, 2 to 8. Go to Ephesians 1. God showers his children with grace. Christ has made this possible. In light of this, then, Christ rightly becomes our central source of gratitude and focus. And this is what the Spirit's been doing, is basically redirecting our attention. A lot of our attention, it's very easy to, to have our attention diverted in this world, especially when there's this many distractions, especially in the United States. Imagine right now, 
if, as in very, a lot of other situations on Earth, right now, there's no lights. There's no television. There's no distractions whatsoever. Think about that. And think about your life now. Everything in your life is meant to divert your attention, essentially, as far as the God of this world is concerned, away from Christ. Everything. Your job, the television, your house, your car, your money, everything. All the counterfeits that he plays with. Do you understand? Those are all designed to divert your attention. Ephesians 1, 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us, listen to this, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. That's not a typo, it's not most, it's every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. How? In Christ. So there you have it, my friends. Every spiritual blessing is a result of being in Christ. Are you grateful yet? You had no uh, right, no title deed to being in Christ. You weren't born with it. In fact, you were born depraved. You were born a slave, and he redeemed you. Grateful yet? Every spiritual blessing as a result of being in Christ. Verse 4 just as He chose us. How? In Him. In other words, even the choice was based on who? Christ. Us being in Him. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us to, the, to adoption as sons. How? Through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the kind intention of His will to the praise of the glory of what? His grace. He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. Again, look at verse 7. In Him. Do you think Paul's trying to say something? I'm serious when I say this. Do you think he's trying to... Look at how often. Couldn't he just say in the beginning, in Christ, all these things? He could have. But look at how often he's saying, in Christ, through Christ, in Him. Do you get it? All spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. Every activity that God does on your behalf by grace is channeled through this fact. In Him, verse 7, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace. In other words, the grace pipeline, as I like to think about it sometimes flows to us through Christ even, which He lavished on us. And when it flows, it overflows. It abundantly flows. Remember, I think it's perisuo. It overflows so much that we begin to live for others, that we begin to spill Christ's love into the laps of others, and then so on and so forth. Again, we are amplifying the Apostle John, who by grace was prepared, a la our title, when he wrote John 1.16, for of his fullness we, are, we have all received and grace upon grace. That's the point up here on the board again. It refers to the fact that God showers his children with grace and love. Christ the Son has made this possible. In light of this, Christ rightly becomes our central source of gratitude and focus. And we just read Ephesians 1, 2 to 8. Okay, go back to John 1.16. John 1.16. I'm going to do a lot of page turning this evening. John 1.16 For of His fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. God showers us with grace as a result of being in Christ. So our gratitude is anchored in Christ. Verse 17 For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. So the truth is that by grace you have been chosen to reign even. To reign. Now this is where it starts becoming almost outlandish. You mean he's not going to just save us 
We're going to reign. The Bible actually uses the word that talks about becoming like kings to reign. Yes. Yes. We're going to reign with Christ forevermore as adopted sons. And this reign, be it by grace, begins at salvation. Go to Romans 5.17. Romans 5.17. This came out on Tuesday as well. So not only do we get every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus, we're also going to reign. One of those blessings is our that we're going to reign. <laughs> I mean, Romans 5.17, For if by the transgression of the one death reigned through the one, <coughs> much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life. That's now, through the one, Jesus Christ. So we see the same word. I'm going to give you it in, in a moment here. Go to verse 21. Verse 21. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You, grace, the whole sphere of it. We're going to reign up here on the board. Let's call it grace reigning. Grace reigning, the reign from Basilao, means to reign as king. For example, exercise dominion. So to exercise, actually be giving kingly type dominion. I think we doubt such things because we don't think of ourselves as royalty. But we are if we're going to be totally honest with ourselves. Go to Ephesians 2.4. Ephesians 2.4. So we're also said to be reigning in life in Christ Jesus. Grateful yet? I mean, come on. For while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, right? The ungodly, the hopeless and helpless. Read Romans 5, Ephesians 2, 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. Remember that entire series on the gospel, salvation, and sanctification. The real work of salvation wasn't just a trip to heaven. He made us alive. He made us new creatures. We were dead, remember? Inanimate, on the side of the road, dead. And then he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us. Guess what? In Christ Jesus. Are you grateful yet? Oh, there's more. So I was, before we dig into more scripture, though, think of, reflect on this. How often do you reflect on the simple fact that you are alive in Christ forevermore? I'm serious. The next time you're complaining about, you know, your coffee being too bitter or, you know, the whatever your problem is, your petty little problem is, when's the last time you reflected on the fact that you have been made alive in Christ forevermore and you didn't deserve it at all? That one fact alone is indescribable and worthy of gratitude for all of eternity including right now. This came up on Tuesday as well, some perspective. Don't forget about the best parts of your life because of familiarity. How about the fact that you're alive in Christ forevermore? Are you, how, do, how in the world do we become familiar? Do you remember when you were saved and you knew it? Do you remember when that happened at least sometime or when you look back, you still have some, uh, hopefully, a, a uh, profound um, experience when you think about when you got saved. How do, how do we get from there to now, to familiarity? How do you go from that, that amount of appreciation, to being a brat? Don't forget about the best parts of your life because of familiarity. Appreciating God's grace is to your benefit been one of the themes. It was one of the primary themes 
tied to the little series we did on familiarity. It's actually to your detriment if you become familiar. It's to your benefit if you shed it. And for those of you searching, like the folks we alluded to earlier, I submit this. Stop looking. I'm serious. Stop looking. There's no secret rock to look under. God's grace is where it's always been, right under your nose. So stop looking. Stop searching for the next high. Stop searching for the next thing, the next person, the next whatever it is that you're searching for. Stop it. Because everything you need is right under your nose. And frankly, do yourselves and everyone else in your lives a big favor. And stop blaming others for your misery. Look, if you're miserable, um, it's not because of others. They may be a, you know, an impetus, a, a thorn in your side, whatever. But let me give you this to think about, to chew on this weekend. Other people are not the reason you are miserable. You are. It's true. Other people are not the reason. I, look, let's face it. Um, I guess we could be miserable about the person who stole the, the lights, right? And, and we could be like stumbling over it and be like, rah, rah, I'm going to sleep out in my camper over here and get them and be all ridiculous about it. But that, that means you gave them power over you. Look, there's no geographical cure. There's no change of workspace cure. There's no, you know, change of uh, spouse cure. There's no change of anything cure. It's this right here. It's all about perspective. If you're miserable, you have to think about something. Because time will show you if you haven't figured it out already. No matter where you go, no matter what you do, you will always run into jackasses. Because I hate to say it this way, but there's, there seems to be way more of them than there are of us. Not that we're not jackasses, but you know what I'm saying. So no matter where you go, there's no searching for something new. There's no resolution that you're going to come up with that's so novel that it's going to outsmart God's grace provision in your life. You know the one that you have right now. You know the, that blessing called gratitude that you should have right now, but that we get familiar and we don't have always. You don't, you're not going to find that in, uh, you know, in uh, Mexico or in New Bedford or wherever you go, you tease your hair up. You're not going to find, you're not going to find that stuff anywhere, but it's already right in front of you. So stop blaming other people. You're miserable because something's wrong with your perspective. It's that simple. So challenge yourselves and ponder the following. And consider your role in the following scene. And this is just me thinking aloud here. At what times do large groups of people get along harmoniously? Just think about that for a second. You're all getting along right now, as far as I can tell. Lois is nudging Bill, but could be something, I don't know, left over. <laughs> it's not. But think about that. At what times do large groups of people get along harmoniously? The answer? When they are all completely focused on something good. Just think about that. So I was thinking about that, and you dwell on it for a moment. Have you ever been to a professional orchestra concert? Like the Boston Pops? Uh, how about a play, like a professional play? I mean, something that's just, you know, really something to behold. Something we would perceive as good, enjoyable. Uh, I don't know what it is for you, but those are a couple of things that I like. Or, you know, something like that. Or how about maybe Disney World? And I'm not saying Disney is godly because... But you know what I'm saying. You're at Disney World, right? And everybody seems to be in a better mood at Disney World. You ever notice how everyone's a lot nicer in those venues? 
much more harmonious even? That's because everyone's focused on something they perceive as being good. So back to the question on the table. At what times do large groups of people get along harmoniously? And, and it doesn't have to be a large group. That's the one that's like striking. It can be two people in a marriage. It could be two people in a marriage. If one of them is complete self-absorbed jackass, and they're always absorbed in themselves, they're not looking at Christ. So there's no harmony. So I'm using the big picture, the big scene, because that seems the one that is easily, more easily to... But there's, you know, any group of any size. So again, the answer, when, do, when is there more harmony in groups? We humans seem to get along best when we have something good to focus on that isn't ourselves. Philippians 4.8. Sound familiar? Go to Philippians 4.8. We humans seem to get along best when we have something good to focus on. When we're all focusing on something good, not ourselves, then we seem to get along. Philippians 4.8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, what? Dwell on these things. See, that's another trick that Satan has everybody sort of under. He gets every, and I'm just as guilty as the next person, so I'm not judging anybody. He gets us thinking about the things that are wrong in life. It's just a change of perspective. Try to spend tomorrow. Seriously, most of you are probably going to go into some kind of a workplace or some kind of a public setting. Try to spend tomorrow dwelling on only good things. Whatever that means. If that means smiling and trying to make others smile, if that means doing something good, I don't know. If that means going outside and looking at the weather and saying, thank you, Lord, although it's going to probably snow, which is beautiful, though. White snow is beautiful let's face it i mean spend a whole day dwelling on only good things i'm serious challenge yourself to do that stop it at the door you know how it is right someone's name comes up that's it as soon as that person's name comes up i can't stand them I, I, there's such i'm not and we just not, and it's like, why can't they just come up? They can't be all bad. Not everything about everybody is all bad. <laughs> so I'm telling you, try this out for tomorrow. Try spending a whole day not allowing yourself to go there. Don't allow, you to, as soon as that goes, you know, you see that person, you're like, ah. don't allow yourself to go there. Dwell on these things. Paul wasn't stupid, and neither was the Holy Spirit who inspired such a passage. There's power in that. Do you understand? There's real power in that. Nobody can take that away from you. Even if you have some jackass in your ear gnawing your ear off, you can choose, honestly, you can choose to think about something worthy of your attention, something noble, something honorable, something good, intrinsically good. Grace, eternal life, every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. How about we start there? And how about we anchor our faith, our lives, there? And then you're untouchable. You're literally untouchable at that point. And Satan hates you. But, you see, it's just a matter of perspective. And I was thinking, you know, when I read Philippians 4, 8, that's what heaven's going to be like. Big group of people focusing on the Lord. Everyone's going to be so focused on worshiping the Lord that we will simply rejoice as a collective together. Our hearts will be so madly in love with Christ that we completely unify. 
Think about that. We're going to be so, there's going to be so much adoration for the Lord that we are just going to unify. Everybody's going to be completely in love with the Lord. And, I mean, that's an amazing thing. I mean, the, the little microcosm of that is really marriage. If the two people are focused on the Lord, then they unify. For over a week now, the Spirit's been emphasizing this idea of familiarity and its awful fruit. And he wants me to put this matter to bed so we can get back to the study of the apostles proper. With that said, we need to read some encouraging scripture. And I'm just going to read it. I'm not going to spend a whole... This scripture is so impregnated with... Uh, magnificent grace that it's going to be hard for me not to stop and say something, but I'm going to bite my tongue. But I want to read a good amount of scripture that's going to remind all of us, and it's going to come from different angles of things to be grateful for, and also in, of things that we should not become familiar with. That's the beauty, look, that's the beauty of reading this. Do you understand? Who's got a Bible? Raise your hand if you've got a Bible. Do you know how powerful that is? No, I'm serious. Do you know how magnificent? Didn't we just read John 1.1? 1, 1? The Word was with God, and then 114, the Word became flesh. Do you know how powerful the Word is? The fact that you have the very blessing that, first of all, you're literate, you can read, and then God provisioned this Bible in English for you to read. That blessing alone is stupendous. It's stupendous. And most if they're even Christians, Christians, this thing is dusty. And if they ever happen to stance to open it before they sold it at a yard sale for a nickel, it'd probably, if it was human, it'd be like, ah! Because it'd be all locked up. Don't make me do that again. It'd be all locked up. How about being familiar with the fact that you have a Bible to read? And that every single time you read that thing, you're empowered. The Spirit is upon you, teaching you, ministering to you with every jot and every tittle. Think about that. Every, that's just every basically, you know, hash, dot, everything in the Bible. How about that? So I just want to read some scripture with you to, to just to recognize the abundance of grace. As John said in John 1.16, grace upon grace. Go to Philippians 3.1, part A only. Philippians 3.1. And again, I'm going to do my best to just bite my tongue and read some scripture with you, and we're going to enjoy the process together. Again, he just wants you to appreciate these things. I mean, Philippians 3.1. Finally, my brethren, what? Rejoice in the Lord. Period. Amen. Yeah, rejoice in the Lord. Go to Romans twelve nine. I mean that. I mean I could end class right there and say, go home and dwell on that. Finally, brethren, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. And everything shrinks away. Every little problem you have, every little you know nudge in your life, as Paul would say, a thorn in your side, um, it just fades away. Romans 12, 9. <clears throat> How about this? Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Persevering in tribulation. Devoted to prayer. And does this sound familiar? It sounds like a summary of our last month. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tri tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil. 
to anyone. Why? Because you'd suffer. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, for, excuse me, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. That's a hard one, isn't it? Because if you claim to be great, see, I'm talking. If you claim to be grace-oriented, guess what that implies? It means if there's two people standing and there's a chasm between you, the grace-oriented one is the one that has to cross the chasm. Grace reaches across. You know, like it did with you in salvation. I'm not just saying. Don't expect that. But they, they're such jackasses. To whom much is given, much is required. Who's a bigger jackass? The one that has the power to leap across the chasm and doesn't? Or the one that can't because they're incapable? Ooh. Ooh, that stings. It stings, doesn't it? Yeah, that's us. That's us. You're not really grace-oriented if you expect an unhealthy, uh, decrepit, lost soul to reconcile with you. You, with the grace orientation, with grace, with the power to do so, ought to be crossing the chasm. I mean, that's what God did for us. So that's how grace works. I know, I know. Spirit's asking an awful lot. But, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. It's not your job, in other words, to judge somebody. What Scripture says is, hey, feed him. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. How about a little more encouraging Scripture that reminds us of all that we ought to be grateful for and all we ought not to become familiar with. How about love? 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Now, if there's one counterfeit in this world, it has to be love. It just has to be. Almost, I mean, let's face it. Turn on a, turn on a worldly radio station, and almost every song is about love. Somehow, some way, almost every song is about love somehow. And if it's about killing somebody or stabbing somebody, it's because they were betrayed in love. I'm serious. Just about every song is a, quote, love song. It's either bitter or sweet. But somehow it goes back to human relationship and love. The reason we end up in those situations, some of these songs are so grotesque, I don't even turn the radio on anymore. Ugh. Certain genres of music, is, it's so bad now. I, I'm like, do you guys ever talk about anything other than sex and counterfeit love? What do we, what is, I mean, that's what our kids are listening to. Not ours, but you know what I'm saying? The general population. So what about love? It's, it's got to be the most counterfeited thing in the universe. Verse 4, 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. That takes about 95% of the world's love out of the equation because everybody who's in love in this world is a bunch of jealous fools. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Does not take into account a wrong suffered. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So that's love. How about the simple fact that you are given fruit of the Spirit? Galatians 5, 22 and 23, I'll read it for the sake of time, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things there is no law. How about the fact that you've been given the fruit of the Spirit? That's something to be grateful for. And remember how we started this evening up here on the board. To appreciate the little things is to appreciate grace. Go to James 3.13. James 3.13. 
I mean, this is what I'm saying. All you have to do is open up your Bible. I mean, look at all the scripture we're going through. It's lovely, right? It's amazing. It's incredible. It's edifying. It's encouraging. I mean, you know, and the apostles, in, mo in many cases, wrote these words. And that's who we're studying. So James 3, 13. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. In other words, look in the mirror and say who you are, even. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. That includes in your own soul. Remember what I was talking about? If, you're, if everybody's focused on Christ, there's no room for this disorder because we're all unified. It's only when you turn in. It's only when you stop focusing on selfish things, on you. Oh, it's me, it's me, it's me. And because it's all about me, everybody else that's in my life that's not a, you know, orienting to my personal beliefs is, is a jackass, and, and, and they're my reason for misery. Um, I, think just, I think that you're not the center of the universe. Let's start with that. You're not the center of the universe. I know, I know, when you were like three months old, you were, and we, you know, coddled you. The rest of the world said, okay, you're, you know, you're basically a blob, so you have to be the center of your own universe. But some of you are 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and you're still acting as if the world revolves around you. And as a result... What does it say? There is disorder in every evil thing. No wonder why your life is chaotic. No wonder why if, 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 if your life, if your, if your innards were to be projected on the screen right now, it would look like, I don't know, something between a black hole and, and a star exploding. Or throw up. How about that? Vomit. I'm serious. Something chaotic, all right? I don't know. You guys think it's easy? You come up here. <laughs> For where jealousy and self... Think about that. Verse 16 is powerful. It's powerful. Where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. If our country does not promote this, I don't know any country that does. It's all about the haves. Walk by any magazine rack. Are there any of those left anymore? Anyways, when there were, walk by any magazine rack and you go, literally, you could just go, this is an inventory of what I'm not. I'm, just not, I'm none of these things, man. And the world's like, that's right. You need to get to it. Let's go. Time's running out. Let's go. If you're not, listen, if you're a woman and you're not, and you're 30 years old and you don't have 16 kids and you can juggle like this, have a, you're a CEO of your own company, uh, uh, I don't know. Your husband's, uh, uh, I don't know, <laughs> some bazillionaire, handsome, jet-flying, oh, and he flies his own jet, too. He does all these, um, he's a renaissance man. If, you, if that's not your life, then you better get snapping, woman. <laughs> and if you don't breastfeed all of those kids at the same time, you're a loser. <laughs> I saw you the other day getting formula. Shame on you! Shame, 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 shame. Oh, Oh, and you have like three dogs, two cats, goldfish, stray cats, feral cats. I'm serious. The, 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 the load, it, it's like the Pharisees, right? I mean, it, it's backbreaking. It's stupid. What, what do we do? We look at those magazines and what's our flesh do? There's disorder in every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure. Remember what Paul said, dwell on these things. Philippians 4. Dwell on these things, things that are pure, honorable, good, intrinsically. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Huh. 
You mean there's actually a calling on our lives to make peace? Yes, there is. If you want peace in your own life, then seek it. Stop blaming everybody else. Stop, stop acting like everybody else is supposed to spoon feed you peace. One more passage. Go to 2 Peter 1.5. I can't believe we're almost out of time. That's because I lied. I knew I was going to talk. I'm going to get in trouble. 2 Peter 1.5. Now, for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control. There's another big one. Self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, of course, love. That's Peter, by the way. That's the Apostle Peter. You know, love. At the end of it, he's saying love. And just to recap up here on the board, what we just went through, any questions, you know, Philippians 3, 1, Romans 12, 9 to 21, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7, Galatians 5, 22 to 23, James 3, 13 to 18, 2 Peter 1, 5 to 7. Whew. And that's just a little sample. That's just a little sample. We, there's a, in other words, there's an awful lot to be grateful for. Amen? It really is. And if you, look, if you feel yourself slipping into the, what do you call it, let's call it the doldrums of uh, familiarity and disorder, pick up your Bible. Just pick it up. Open it up. Read. You don't have to go far. There's so much in there to be grateful for. And that's the antithesis of familiarity. And that, my friends, is how he delivers us. And I think I'll close with this. All of this good work has reminded me of a song that I love to sing. Others might not like it when I sing it, but I like to sing it. And I don't know all the words, so. But here are the lyrics to it. A Place Called Grace. So many years I heard it told. The story of compassion. A prodigal son who left the fold and found no satisfaction. On my knees, Lord, I cried out to you. I'm so alone. But if there's room in your house for one more, I'm ready to come back home. I know there is a place where arms of compassion welcome me home. Sweet mercy falls like rain. I know there's a place called grace. So many days I've trusted grace Yet I have to wonder how many times my human strength has kept me from surrender. The more I learn just to lean on the cross, the more I see. When I fall, I will fall to the place where mercy reaches me. If it seems that my courage is strong, there's just one reason. He's my rock. When my faith is all gone, he holds me in his arms, gives me strength to carry on. Amen? Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this wonderful privilege to gather together to break bread, the very bread of life, Father. Thank you for giving us scripture. Thank you for your spirit inspiring it so that we might be encouraged by it. So many years later, Father, for this word is living and active in our lives. We're just so very grateful, overwhelmed with gratitude, Father. May we carry this throughout our days. May your Spirit encourage us throughout each day, remind us. May we have the strength and the tenacity to continue reading our Bibles on our own time. May we never stray too far from the fold. We ask these things in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Thank you.